2025 marks 100 years of quantum mechanics, and so it's appropriate that the Nobel Prize in Physics this year tells a story that spans this entire century of quantum. The prize is awarded to three scientists, John Clark, Michel Deveret, and John Martinez, quote, for the discovery of macroscopic quantum mechanical tunneling and energy quantization in an electric circuit. Let's break down the citation language to understand what these words mean, the science behind them, and some of this 100-year history. In everyday classical physics, if you have an object that's placed at rest on a landscape going up and down, corresponding to having more or less potential energy, the starting height corresponds to its total energy. It's the maximum height you can ever reach. Depending on what the landscape looks like, the total energy in starting position may keep it stuck in what's known as a potential well, a bowl that the object can't escape from. Almost as soon as it was developed in 1925, people realized that the rules of quantum mechanics allowed a particle in a potential well to escape it while still obeying the total energy limit, just as though it had found a tunnel through the barrier that confined it. This is quantum mechanical tunneling. In the 1920s, scientists such as George Gamow used this idea to explain certain types of radioactivity. The nucleus of an atom creates a potential well that traps pairs of protons and neutrons known as alpha particles, but there can still be a chance that this particle spontaneously escapes from this trap via tunneling, leading to a radioactive nucleus. Note that this barrier is very thin. It's tens of thousands of times smaller than a nanometer. Potential wells also involve another aspect of quantum mechanics, that of energy quantization. In classical physics, the total energy of an object could be at any level, but in quantum mechanics, only certain energies are allowed inside a well. You can count how many. That's what the word quantum means. A quantum is something you can count. By the 1940s and 50s, scientists understood much more about the countable energy levels that electrons could have inside materials like metals, semiconductors, and superconductors. Moreover, they were getting better at making devices like transistors and other microelectronics that work by moving electrons between these quantum levels. In 1957, Leo Asaki, who, like quantum mechanics, is celebrating his 100th birthday this year, created a device that used two different types of semiconductors to create a potential barrier between them that was possible for electrons to tunnel through. By putting the device into an electric circuit, Asaki could actually tune the likelihood of tunneling in such a way that it made it more likely for current to flow one way rather than the other, a type of device known as a diode, which is used in all sorts of electronics. This marked the first time that controllable tunneling was engineered into a practical device. Shortly after Asaki's work, Ivor Giever created a nanometer-thin insulating barrier between a metal and a superconductor and demonstrated controllable tunneling across it. And Brian Josephson developed theories about how tunneling across such barriers would work between two superconductors. Asaki, Giever, and Josephson shared the 1973 prize in physics for this work on tunneling. In the next decade, Gerd Binning and Heinrich Rohr created a device that used tunneling of electrons between atoms on a conducting surface and the tip of a sharp metal wire placed around a nanometer above it to create images of single atoms. Their work creating this scanning tunneling microscope was awarded part of the 1986 Nobel Prize in Physics. Going back to this year's citation, this background should show you that quantum mechanical tunneling and energy quantization in an electric circuit already formed the basis for prizes awarded many decades ago. What's new this year is the macroscopic part, and to understand that part, we need to understand something about superconductors. Metals conduct electricity with low resistance. You can tilt the potential energy that they experience using a battery or power supply to create an electric current, just like water flows in a current downhill. However, when you cool down many metals, such as aluminum, lead, or zinc, to within a few degrees of absolute zero, the current can suddenly flow along at a constant potential energy. In a regular electric circuit, a battery or power source is needed to continually push currents around a loop made of normal conductors. But once an electric current is set up in a loop of superconducting wire, it will circulate forever without slowing down and without any battery needed. Though superconductivity was discovered over 100 years ago, it wasn't until the 1950s that scientists were able to explain its properties using quantum mechanics, research that garnered two sets of Nobel Prizes. It turned out that this supercurrent can't be explained by understanding the behavior of single electrons. Rather, it is due to the collective, correlated behavior of many, many electrons inside the material. Only a fraction of a percent of electrons in the material are part of this collective superconducting state. 
But given that you might have a trillion trillion electrons and a hunk of superconducting material in total, this superconducting collection of them is considered a macroscopic object. A key property characterizing the quantum description of a superconductor is something called its phase. Superconductors can have different phases, which I'll here represent by different colors. With no current running through them, the phase is the same throughout the material. But when you run a current through it, the phase changes along the superconductor. Rather than a current driven by charge flowing from a higher potential energy to a lower potential energy, the supercurrent is phase driven. A supercurrent around a loop corresponds to a phase cycling around it. The faster the phase cycles, the larger the current. Putting this together with our tunneling story, by placing a nanometer thin barrier between two superconductors with different phases, one can get a phase gradient across the boundary corresponding to a supercurrent tunneling across it. This effect is what won Brian Josephson a Nobel Prize in the 1970s, and this type of device is now known as a Josephson junction. As scientists understood more about these junctions, they found models of their potential energy that looked like a particle stuck in a potential well that could tunnel through a barrier. However, there are two important differences between this picture and the one we started out with. First, the ball here isn't a microscopic particle like an electron or alpha particle. It's representing the collective macroscopic superconducting state of all these electrons in the Josephson junction device. Second, the barrier in the plot isn't a barrier over a distance. It's a barrier between different phase configurations and supercurrent flows in the entire circuit. The tunneling isn't something going from one place to another. It's a tunneling between two different supercurrent states. To give a simple example, imagine a loop of superconductor with current flowing around it clockwise. To get the current to flow counterclockwise instead, you would think you'd have to slow down the clockwise current, bring it to a stop, and then get it flowing in the opposite direction. But with macroscopic quantum tunneling, you can go directly between these two states without passing through the intermediate ones. The 1985 experiment that won this year's Nobel Prize convincingly demonstrated and controlled this type of macroscopic quantum tunneling in an electric circuit. This work was part of a general shift in scientists' understanding. The rules of quantum mechanics didn't just apply to microscopic objects, but have equal applicability to large things under the right conditions. In the years since then, scientists have built on this work to create superconducting devices with multiple Josephson junctions that exquisitely control the different macroscopic states they're in. A driving force behind this research is that such devices can be put into one state or another state, or into any of infinitely many combinations of these two starting states technically known as superpositions. A controllable device of this type is known as a quantum bit or qubit, and these superconducting qubits have shown great promise as the architectural basis for fundamentally new types of computers known as quantum computers. Governments, industry, and academic researchers, including two of the three laureates, have put considerable resources into developing these computers since the 1980s, an ongoing process that will likely be the subject of future Nobel Prizes as we enter the second century of new understanding and new applications of quantum mechanics. <laughs>